Hello everyone and welcome to AIDS Map Women Self Empowerment Against HIV Stigma. I'm thrilled to be joined by an absolutely phenomenal panel. There is one more panelist who can't physically be here in person. It's um, MP Florence Shilomi. You may have noticed there are a few things going on in Parliament at the moment, but I have spoken to her earlier and we will be hearing from her throughout the broadcast. But if I'd like to introduce you to who we have here. First of all, I'm sure many people are familiar <laughs> with Angelina Namiba. <coughs> Again, I've asked for like a sentence about your bio and you've sent a little bit more, but it's not as Plus big. two sentences. Oh yeah, saying. okay. <laughs> but Angelina has been living with HIV for 27? Nine. 29 <laughs> years, has been working in HIV across so many different organisations and areas for 26 years, um, founding member of the 4M network of mental mothers and all round fabulous mm -hmm. lady. <laughs> <laughs> Next we have the absolutely gorgeous Longret Quadem. Longret is also a co-director of the 4M network of mental mothers, mm -hmm. an advocate on sexual and reproductive health and rights for women living with HIV, peer support, meaningful involvement and sustainable funding for community mm -hmm. space. Thank you so much. Thank for you, Susan. Wonderful to have you. And Fungi Morau, who was here very recently. Yes, yes. Good to be, have you back on the sofa. Good to be Fungi. back. Uh, Fungi is a researcher in HIV field with a special interest in mental health, migration and education for adolescent girls making informed choices. And you're also affiliated with national and international advisory boards. I am. How many? Uh, I, ooh, oh, now you put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a difficult question. <laughs> Quite a few. Quite a few. I mean, it's uh, SWIFT, uh, uh, Beyond Stigma, the HIV and Women uh, Steering Group, a 4M Network. <laughs> oh, my goodness, the <laughs> list goes on. <laughs> Quite a bit. And finally, fabulous HIV London-based doctor, and researcher with an interest in health and equity. And until very recently, you took a little break to be a student. Is yeah, that right? I hung out with people half my age, which is <laughs> interesting. <laughs> um, so I learned about researching health inequalities. Fantastic. So the summer we will be discussing many of the issues that are that you feel very passionate about. So everyone watching. Do please get your questions over on Facebook and Twitter. They're going to be sent over to me onto this iPad, so I will try to answer as many as I can. So, first of all, um, <coughs> can I ask you, Angelina, um, black women with <laughs> HIV face intersecting forms of stigma. What are some of these intersections that we face? Gosh, Susan, that's a really good question. <laughs> there are quite many, actually, but I mean, I'm not going to be able to list all of them, but we know the usual ones, the race, the gender, uh, the stigma around, you know. You know, sometimes even when you're, you don't have children, mm. people often assume that they keep on asking you, why don't you have children? But maybe you've made the choice not to have children. The stigma mm. is against that. Being a single mom, you know, some people have immigration issues, some people are, are living in poverty. So, so many, so many other stigmas that are related to HIV. So when you stick HIV into the mix, they just kind of exacerbate the situation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Longra, do you think um, migrant women with HIV face any particular challenges? Um, yeah, I mean, there are quite a number of them. But I will read it down to one particular one that I find is quite common among um, migrant women living with HIV, which is immigration status. Mm. And it's also sort of sometimes a factor as a cause of HIV, but also could be a result of HIV. And then you find a lot of women trying to settle their status in the UK. And as a result of that, because of the stigma, Mm. They are unable to find the right support. 
Mm -hmm. And so they end up out of the immigration system. Right. And so they have no recourse to public funds and no right to work. And then that is a restriction that sort of exacerbates the stigma. And then it, it kind of makes them vulnerable to domestic violence, homelessness, exploitation, and host of other things. And I think as well, mental health. Mm. But also that then when they want to regulate that immigration status, then they're forced to maybe go on a, like a five-year visa um, route or 10-year visa route. And every two and a half years, they have to fork out at least 5,000 pounds to then make that application. And so that perpetuates the cycle of poverty because right. then after all those years of not being able to work, now you're having to work to pay back to stay here. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, mental health is just a <coughs> massive thing as well. So I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. There are so many issues. And we're really lucky in the UK that people, regardless of their immigration status, <coughs> actually can have access to, to treatment. But do you mm. think people realise that widely? I, uh, well, I'm a migrant. I was a migrant yeah. when I first moved here. And it's not told to you mm. and unless you have the strength to access, say, peer support and other services that then signpost you to this person, that person, that person, you don't know it. You mm. don't know if you're entitled to even find a GP. You don't know if you're entitled to, have, to go for HIV testing, even mm. when you're feeling poorly. Mm. You don't know these things because nobody tells you these things. Even when you then get told, uh, if you stumble maybe into an HIV testing clinic mm. and you find out that you're living with HIV, nobody says you have access to all these other wonderful services that can make you feel and live a better life. Nobody says you can go to talking therapies no, mm. and that they're covered. Nobody says peer support is free. Right. So um, I think it leads to a lot of isolation. And um, so with some women that I've talked to, a lot of regret why they even left they're either the war-torn or poverty-stricken countries to come to somewhere where they're feeling a lot more lonely and a lot more isolated and do not know what they are entitled to. Yeah, yeah that, that sounds really harrowing. And is that something that you're, you're seeing with some of your patients, Rakeshri? Yeah, definitely. I think it's really complicated and I don't think the information is there and I mm -hmm. think there are barriers put up. Um, where sometimes even healthcare services aren't aware that they should be able to register migrants, so for example, GP services. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a really great report by the National AIDS Trust recently where they interviewed migrants living with HIV and it found that many had been put off from accessing any care because they're worried wow. about being reported to the immigration services. Um, and, you know, in HIV, we do tell everyone that their care is free, but we often have to talk to other services and say, you know, this is related to someone's HIV, so it should be free, you shouldn't be charging them. Yeah, no, absolutely. Healthcare. And if we could just go back to um, healthcare settings, um, women with HIV are, uh, seem more likely to experience stigma in the healthcare settings than anywhere else. Why do you think that is? So it re makes me really angry to hear stories mm. about this, and I hear them <laughs> a lot, sadly. I think there's a lot of outdated knowledge and attitudes amongst healthcare workers who don't work in HIV. Some of them still think we're back in the 80s, they don't know about U equals U. I think because um, of kind of um, thinking about some of their attitudes with regards to homophobia and HIV, for example, I think there are a lot of, there's a lot of prejudice. I think healthcare workers who come into contact with people living with HIV regularly don't, don't have this stigmatising attitudes, but it's the ones that perhaps don't so much. So as HIV doctors, it's part of our job to educate our colleagues about where we are with HIV mm. now, what HIV stigma looks like. Um, so we want to hear about it from our patients. If, if we hear someone has um, experienced stigmatising attitudes from a healthcare service in the hospital, for example, mm. we work at, then we will take that upon ourselves to go to that department and say, you guys need some teaching. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. And, and what kind of experiences are we hearing? Oh, are you looking at yeah. me? <laughs> we start with you. I'm sure everyone's got no, stories. No, no, it's really interesting that you should ask that because just this afternoon I was speaking to um, one of the ladies that we know. She's living with HIV and um, she was telling me about how um, she had to, she was supposed to have surgery for a specific condition, but then when she went in, they told her that, you know, she has a, I think it was a fatty liver and she's quite 
well blessed mm -hmm. yeah in in all the areas <laughs> in all the right areas <laughs> and so the consultant said to her well you need to go and lose some weight before we can actually do the surgery so she's gone out and she's done all her walking and you know eating well but then she comes back and they keep telling her well you need to stop eating um because she's an African woman, you need to stop eating those fried foods and stop using, you know, that red oil to cook. But actually, she doesn't even eat a lot of fried food. And she's from Kenya. We don't use palm oil in Kenya. Right. So it's just like they're making an assumption based on the fact that she's an African woman and just not... Because she said, I've done all the things you've told me, but we haven't lost. So look at what else is happening. This is somebody who started taking treatment a long time ago. Right. So it could be related to some yeah. of the older drugs. We don't know. But they're not hearing and trying to think about, can we see what else is going on rather than just assume that I'm eating fatty food, which I'm not. Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah. I, th I think weight gain is, is a, a real issue for so many, so many women. And then you know, quite often it's, like, it's dismissed. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you hearing other experiences of stigma in, in healthcare settings? I mean, mine was about weight gain, really, um, but um, rather weight loss. Right. Because um, I was told that I was pre-diabetic. Right. Um, and they said to me, uh, you'll need to lose some weight. So I thought, uh, me? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> lose I'm some from weight. Where? There yeah. was nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> A leg <laughs> <maybe. Yeah. laughs> I was thinking, She's talking about like you just use a blanket statement on people. Yeah. Like, I know, yeah, just like <laughs> lose, lose, lose weight. <laughs> oh, and is that something you've experienced? I've, I've, my mind was actually quite, and and to, even when I sort of reflect now, it it makes me feel really sad. I I went to the GP, and I had felt something in my breast, and yes, like Angelina saying, I'm also quite blessed mm. in that area. And she rightly sort of said, I'm going to send you to the breast clinic. Uh, because A, because you're ample, it's really difficult to just do a, a normal exam, they're specialists. When I arrived there, I, I know that I'm quite vocal and I can self-advocate, but then I felt like I was muted. Mm. All the other non-women that are not from ethnic minorities were taken to these really nice suites because they left some of the doors open and you could see I was ushered to a room with boxes and bags. It was a cupboard. Right. And she sat there and she lectured me on things like losing weight and not eating chocolate. And, and I did not get an exam. She made me take off my bra, put my hands on my waist. And yeah, yeah. and started lecturing me about bras. I'm like, girl, I buy the best bras. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and to this day, I've never had that exam. Really? I have never had that exam. And I'm just really grateful. I think this is why... I wanted to go last because there's a flip side to it. Where I'm from in Brighton, my HIV consultant, when she hears this, she's A, going to flip, and B, mm. she's really good at making sure that within our healthcare settings, we are heard. When I had my second child, mm. the minute she heard that that child had been born, she came from her clinic to the ward to make sure that I'd been looked after, the baby mm. had looked after, the healthcare team on that ward knew exactly how to manage what was going to happen to me and the baby because I was on my own. We, me and the baby until we're discharged. So we've got healthcare professionals like Rageshri yes. and my doctor Yvonne mm. that are getting it absolutely, absolutely mm. right. And then there's some that I don't know if they just see color or, mm. or they just see, oh, you're obese, you're lazy or whatever it is that they see. But it, it puts people off mm. to going to seek help. And all the doctors always say, what, come forward as soon as you find a problem. Yeah. So where am I supposed to go if you're going to turn me away? That's... Absolutely appalling. And, and I think now would be quite a good time to um, turn to Florence's video because um, many women have shared with me that, that um, black women experience racism mm -hmm. in healthcare settings. And I asked Florence about the uh, impact of racism on, on health outcomes. So can we hear from Florence now, please? Florence, thanks so much for joining us today. Really great to join you, Susan. Florence, we know that black women face worse health outcomes in the UK across a number of different uh, disease areas, including HIV. How much do you think that racism contributes to this? 
No, and I think that's such an important question. When you look at health inequalities for black women, whether it's high blood pressure, diabetes, um, issues around some of the diseases that affect black women, I think of a disease that affects my late, my late mother, sickle cell anemia, um, all those areas, I think sometimes you find that black women continue to just struggle on without seeking medical help and support. Because for a lot of them, when they have gone through, whether it's to their GP, to the pharmacist, or, you know, and it's needed hospital appointment, the treatment they've received hasn't always been a good experience. And in a sense, we need to look at whether there are issues of racism within the NHS service towards black women. There are a number of reports that have been conducted by the Health and Social Select, Select Committee. I'm also part of an organisation called the All Party Parliamentary Group on Black Maternal Death. They had a big report looking at black women's experiences in childbirth. And I think we have to be honest in calling out some of the unconscious bias and racism that black women are suffering because there are major implications, including health implications, if these women don't come forward. So I think, you know, we do need to be honest and have that discussion around why is it that some of the areas and challenges that black women are facing and if there are links to racism and how do we continue to call that out? Yeah, absolutely. Raghashree, what has your research shown about the impact on, on race of outcomes of, of people of colour living with HIV? Sure, I mean, I can talk about two pieces of research. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. <laughs> um, so the first one is quite a, a big study um, and it's using information from this big cohort study called UK Chic, which has been running since I think 2000, um, collecting data on people living with HIV from all around England, um, led by Caroline Sabin. And what we did was we analysed data from 12,000 um, people. Um, so these are heterosexual men and women to look at kind of the HIV outcomes. And what we did find was differences by ethnicity. So we found that um, particularly black people and some other people of colour tended to present later, so with lower CD4 counts. Um, everyone seemed to start treatment at the same time and become virally suppressed. But we found that people of colour and some black people were more likely to have viral rebound, meaning that they've come off treatment and were more likely to spend less time in care. So I think what that really showed us was that there's lots of barriers, social barriers, healthcare um, service related barriers, which means it's harder to stay in care, harder to get tested early for people of colour and particularly black mm. people. So that was quite, um, it kind of backed up what we were seeing in clinical practice. Um, and the second piece of research was from the PRIME study, which I'm sure you all know about. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> menopause. Um, but we looked at the survey data from PRIME um, and we actually didn't look at menopause at all. So this was a survey of older older women living with HIV. And we, asked, we looked at the um, answers on mental health and on kind of social factors. And what we found was that black elder women um, were more likely to report being severely psychologically distressed, but less likely to be diagnosed with a mental health condition and less likely to be on treatment, meaning that people weren't identifying their mental health condition and treating them. And the other, I think, really eye-opening thing from that study was that they were more likely to live in poverty, mm -hmm. um, despite being more likely to have a university education. So mm. more qualified, less likely to be yeah. in a high, well-paid job. Yeah, that's that's shocking. Yeah. And and but they're not surprising. Mm. I mean, has anyone experienced or have you heard of um, people that you work with experiencing racism in healthcare settings? There is so much. I mean, uh, one of the things that we do and I think we do well at 4M Network is the Pregnancy Baby and Beyond program. And we are still seeing a lot of our sisters being treated very badly on maternity wards because they're living with HIV. And we kind of like think we know about U equals U. We know about the roots of transmission of HIV. That shouldn't be there. And then you also get these, um, uh, again, I'll speak from some, some, some personal experience, where you're asked by a healthcare professional, how did you contract HIV? Like, what does it mean? What does it even matter how I contracted mm. HIV? It's about how am I living? With, with am I living well with HIV rather than asking me about something that's almost, almost that can actually trigger some horrible things about when I contracted HIV and, 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 and things like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, 
Often, as, as black women, when we speak up, or women of colour, when we, we talk about our symptoms or our side effects or how we're feeling, we are sometimes not believed. What, what is testimonial injustice? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very technical term from philosophy, mm. I don't expect anyone to know about it, but I've been doing lots of writing yes. about it. Um, so basically, it means that um, when someone says their testimony, so they say something, mm. they're less likely to be heard and less likely to be believed. And that can be due to lots of reasons, but it's often due to their gender, due to their ethnicity, mm. due to their age, for example. So particularly women of colour and particularly black women are less likely to be seen as credible when they, when they give their mm. testimony. Mm. And we see this in lots of different ways in healthcare and in research, but particularly when we think of patients not being heard or believed by their doctors, it's much more likely to happen to black women, sadly. Um, mm. and I think that's something that we really need to be aware of and if it happens recurrently it means that again people are more likely to, to say what's going on because they know they're going to be disbelieved mm. so what's the point? You know, absolutely and, and what advice would you give to someone who, who may be experiencing this? I think I mean I'll start and I'm sure my sisters yeah. here can pick up from what I say. I think the important thing is to speak out but then as, as we've had even if you're very vocal, even if you're an advocate, sometimes when, when you're in a vulnerable position, you're not able to speak. So the advice I would give is to reach out to peer support because you can always take somebody along or somebody can go with you and speak up on your behalf because it's not always easy. I mean, I've been in a situation whereby I was in a vulnerable position and somebody said something to me and vocal as I am, I didn't feel able to say anything because she was looking after me. She was taking care of me. Mm. I thought I couldn't say anything. So I think reach out and speak to somebody. That's one thing that you can do. Um, over to you, Long Right. Yeah, I think um, it's also understanding that there are um, complaint systems in these places. Mm. And so I know that, as Angelina said, sometimes you might not feel um, confident enough to speak up for yourself. Do get in touch with your peers. We like at Forum. We do have sessions where we, you know, support people to do these sort of things. So speak to someone who can then support you to do the complaint. Like even if you can't do it yourself, we can support you to sort of put a formal complaint in. But these systems are there to support you. So just be aware that there are systems that you can make complaints to. Absolutely. Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to add? I was going to say another thing that we, we uh, that I see a lot of people starting to do now, a lot of women are starting to do now, is when they're feeling a lot more better in their own space, when they're not feeling as vulnerable, they now reach out to see if there's any training for their doctors mm. that they can have to better understand the next person that's going to walk through that door and lessen, uh, sort of to stop them experiencing what they've experienced. And there's loads of training out there, even doctor study days and things like that. There's, there's loads of that. And... I get invited to Brighton quite a lot to do a doctor study day to just for them to see what a person living with HIV looks like mm. and mm. what I don't expect them to say to me and how I'd like to be treated when I walk through the surgery. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what advice would you give to someone who may think they've been treated differently because of their, their race? Um, so I think be aware of your rights. So everyone has the rights to health care that is non-judgmental um, and, you know, everyone should have equal rights to that. So being knowing your complaint process is really mm. important. Mm. But I, um, for people who are worried about not being heard at their appointments, I always say prepare if you can. So if you can write down before what you want to know, um, if you're going somewhere where they may not know your HIV medications, try and take a, a list of your HIV medications with you. And if you don't get what you want, you can have a second opinion. You're mm. entirely title to it and actually we as doctors ask each other stuff all the time so we are second opinions of each other <laughs> so it's absolutely okay and we don't get offended if you do want a second opinion it's important you get what you want fantastic and I think it might be a good time to to turn back to to Florence because there's been a lot of discussion recently about the UK exceeding the 90-90-90 target. So is it 90% of people diagnosed, on treatment and undetectable? And there's an aim for us to actually get to zero transmission by 2030. But I think that the, like the inequities that we see, particularly experienced by people of colour, may hamper us reaching that. So I spoke to Florence and asked her what the all-party parliamentary group on HIV is doing and asking the, the government to do to, to address the inequities experienced by people of colour. Over to Florence now, please. 
Florence, what is the all party parliamentary group on HIV um, calling the government to do towards addressing the health inequities experienced by black people with HIV? Really, really good. And I think one of the key things that the APPG group, the all party parliamentary group is calling for is testing. It's a really, really quick and easy way to make sure that those living with HIV can get the right treatment. But if they're not tested, they won't know. So opt out testing across all healthcare settings, that needs to be central. This is a quick, easy intervention that the government can do now. I don't know why the government is still dragging their feet on that. These um, testing interventions will also help reach out to women and BME communities in their own settings, in their local GP areas, in their community centres, going out to them. I think we also need a UK wide campaign in terms of making sure that black and minority ethnic people and most importantly, women know the benefits of PrEP. There's still a lot of myth around this. This needs to be dismantled. That's a really key way in tackling the health inequalities. And I think lastly, a big push on anti-stigma campaign so that we can actually dispel some of those myths, change attitudes to people living with HID and make sure that interventions and understanding increase in understanding. So rolling out things like HIV testing buses, we've had them out in my constituency in Vauxhall, in Brixton. All those things need to be rolled out to help address the key inequalities, health inequalities faced by black women living with HIV. That's great hearing that from Florence. Is there, was, was everyone agree with what Florence says? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is there anything else you think that we should be, or that the government needs to do now, Rageshri? So I think racism is experienced throughout the life course. People mm -hmm. experience it from birth. They go through institutions, so schooling, they go through employment, healthcare, um, all the different places where they may experience institutional racism. So it needs to be like a whole big societal um, approach to that. I think within healthcare services, thinking specifically, specifically around HIV, thinking about how can we get more people tested, how can we get people to access PrEP, and really the best ways to learn how to do that is to get the communities involved to tell us what, what is the best route for us yeah. to reach you. <laughs> yeah, Ab absolutely. I mean, if we could move over to self-stigma, because that can have a, a really significant impact on the, on the lives of women with HIV. Angelina, would you like to tell us what self-stigma <laughs> actually is? I think I'll just simplify it to say it's the, you know, the negative attitude or the negative way that we look at ourselves um, as a result of an illness that we have, and obviously in this case it would be HIV. Um, that can, if, if you think about, for instance, some of us when we're diagnosed, all you saw around was negative stuff around HIV. So then inevitably when you're diagnosed, that's what you have about the illness. So it's quite easy for you to then become to self-stigmatize against yourself. But I always say that, you know, I mean, there's um, just jumping a little bit ahead of here is there's things that individually we can do. We know that science has gone miles away and we know that we don't yet have a pill to chat to tackle stigma. But there are lots of things that we can do from an individual level to try and tackle the self-stigma. Mm. May I share a couple also? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to be hearing, <laughs> I want to tell you to tell me more about all the work that you're doing around that, but if you can I'll do share. a bit about just yeah. self-stigma because um, it, it's not going to take organisations to do it. We yes. also need to work at it ourselves. Mm. So I think there are three things, I think, there are many, but I'll talk about three things that as an individual we can do to start to tackle to self-stigma. I think the first thing we need to do is to change the way that we think about HIV. Um, mm -hmm. HIV is a very tiny virus. Um, it's, we are, the rest of, uh, as an individual, you are much bigger than HIV. It doesn't define who you are. So change the way you see it, first of all. The second thing is about um, minding the language that we use around HIV, whether we are referring to ourselves or to others. You know, there's lots of examples I can use, but I'll just use one, which is we tend to talk about disclosure all the time. Mm. And I just think the term disclosure, it's if I say to you, Susan, I want to disclose something to you, what do you think? It's going to be something bad. Exactly, right? Yes. So disclosure is a loaded, it's a legal, it's a very heavy term. Whereas if I say to you, I want to share something with you, Susan, what would you think? Oh, I think, oh, yeah, I like things being shared <laughs> with me. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. you change the language a yeah. little bit and yeah. you just make a whole lot of difference because yeah. language in itself can also be stigmatizing. Mm -hmm. So we change it, we tackle it. And the last thing I think, there are many things, but the last thing I'll share is we need to kick stigma out of our lives. And by that I mean literally kick stigma out of our lives. So if somebody comes and stigmatizes against you, we need to find ways 
and as responses towards it. So for instance, someone comes and says, oh, Susan, I hear you have HIV. And I can say, yes, I have HIV. At least I know what I have. Do you know what you've got? <laughs> yeah, that's but, one thing you can actually yeah. say. You know, and you can say this, and you can also say, yeah. So I live with HIV. I'm living and thriving with it. Do you have a problem with it? Mm -hmm. So you find ways to actually push it back onto them, kick it out of your life. Absolutely, that that that's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. And Longre, what impact do you think self stigma can have on women with HIV? I think it's, it's huge because it affects your quality of life as a person. It affects how you see yourself and so how you can access your rights as a human being. Because if you're feeling less than, then you are unable to advocate for yourself mm -hmm. and access those things that are yours by right. And so I think um, ultimately, I think it affects your life completely. So. For me, I, I choose to see stigma as, you know, addressing stigma apart from everything that Angelina said. It's also about self-love. And for me, it starts with the awareness because I wasn't even aware of self-stigma. Mm -hmm. I, I just saw stigma and I didn't know that there was stigma from the self and stigma from the community. And that stigma from the self is as a result of the stigma from the community. Absolutely. But, but it's really a bit like chicken and the egg because then, <laughs> because you have that self-stigma, you see the stigma outside, but it's there as well. Yeah. And so it's a very long road. I'm still on that road. Yes. But every day I try and just check with myself. I think, you know, a lot of the times we're looking outside and obviously there are things that are challenging, but I like that THC advert that says it starts with you. Yeah. Because I think until you get to the point where you feel comfortable with the HIV, anything else you see would be a trigger. Mm. So, but then it's a long journey. And I think it's just understanding that it doesn't matter how often you, you, you know, you carry on going, just keep moving. Peer support, you know, you know, t talk to other people, have time for yourself and just understand your rights as well. So I, I would say just find time to um, listen to yourself. As long as you can get comfortable, it will make the journey easier for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that, that's... Yeah. But peer support will help as well. Just be around people who will uplift you. That's such a yeah. good point. And, and 4M is doing incredible <laughs> work in, in addressing self-stigma in, uh, in collaboration with a fantastic organization called NAM H. Oh, wonder who's <laughs> 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 um, And also um, supported by part of uh, Fast Track Cities initiative. Can you tell us about some of the work that you've been doing to address um, self-stigma for 4M? So to date, we have run three by, please chip it, three by two, two half day workshops with uh, women uh, living with HIV, trying to um, manage to A, understand, sort of going down to the fundamentals of what is HIV, what is self-stigma, how do we deal with that? And then we, then it was called something else, then we started calling it stigma empowerment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was called stigma, stigma empowerment training, and then we decided to change it to self-empowerment. Self-empowerment. That's a lot better, yeah. So it, 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 it read better. and. I think I've always, with this, we see women first when you go into Zoom, the cameras are off, the cameras are off, people are not want. by the time you get to lunchtime, you show the first break, slowly start to see the cameras coming on, because I think it is just, that, that's just understanding that you're not alone, that everybody that's on the Zoom chat is here for the same reason, they want to learn, they want to, 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 to teach, they want to be better, they want to do better. And uh, we've had so many, so many women join. We, I think we've been really, really lucky. We've had fif between 15 and 25. But per session, yeah. I mean, per we've session. Had, we've, had, we've done three sessions, the same session three times. May I jump in, Fungi? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then what you're going to do is you're going to have a face-to-face -face training in November, on November the 23rd, trying to bring together all the women who've attended the sessions um, by face to face and it will be a hybrid event but one of the things that just to pick up on what Fungi said is and a part of what we also do is around enabling them to develop a support network mm -hmm. um, and also to you know do stigma busting activities so that they can understand and comprehend and share 
the U equals U message, as well as, you know, we also do creative writing, creative writing. Mm -hmm. and uh, mindfulness for well-being, and also, you know, skills around, you know, self-advocacy as well, and mental health. So it's just a whole round of thing, which is just about, yes, it's around self-empowerment, around sti stigma, but also it's around how to develop their skills in order to be able to deal with it. Fungi, so I just wanted to throw that little plug about no, no, the that's workshop absolutely that's fine. I mean, I, I always like to say that <laughs> on one of the days, we always end up by sort of saying, you know, the letters HIV give us something positive mm -hmm. other than the science that says uh, HIV. And what did we have last time? Oh, uh, healthy. We had happy, 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 happy healthy, informative, voluptuous. But, but yeah, we had, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite was incredible. A happy, yeah. happy, intelligent virgin. Yes. Oh, <laughs> Space where women feel safe to, yeah. mm. to 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 joke, but on a something that's really serious because they're learning, mm -hmm. yeah, and they feel really mm. really empowered to then say, do you know what? This is how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what? Good. And and what difference have you seen, like in terms of when women start to how they are when they they've had this? I think I'm going to throw it to you, Longretta. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a bit like what um, Fungi was saying, because people come at the start and they're really very subtle and hiding and stuff. Mm. And then by the end of it, you know, we do the creative writing as well. And I think the joyous thing about the creative writing is it gives you a chance to write about your feelings without mm. really making it about you. Yeah. And then you find even when we do the writing, at first people are like, oh, I don't want to talk. And then they start to talk and everybody wants to share. And by the time we're finishing, we're actually finishing with, with a song called <laughs> Waka, Waka Kosha Song. Yes. And it means that it means you're worthy. Yes. And you see these women, it's almost like a flower. <laughs> you're just like, yeah, and they're shouting and screaming. And they're like, oh, when are we having the next one? <laughs> so you see that, and people, and a lot of them give feedback. And they just say, it's just great to have this space and know that you're not alone and understand that everybody's having their journey, but we're all doing this together. And it's just incredible. I always just feel so inspired mm. because you can see the difference it mm. literally makes in people's lives. So um, just to add that people should remember to join us on the 23rd of um, November. November. So you can sign online. And, and do I get to hear this song? Yes. Well, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. As I lead, Fungi, 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 please lead us. Well, well, I was going to actually say this song, we need to sort of thank the, the, the writers of the song. This was written by young children living with HIV in Zimbabwe that are part of the Jandiri house. And it was through a self-empowerment program run by uh, Beyond Stigma. Right. And at the end of it, to wrap everything together, they wanted to write something as part of their self-evaluation. And they wrote a song called Waka Kosha Iwe, it means you're worthy. Waka Kosha Iwe, it means you're important. So that, that's kind of like the chorus, but it goes into, you know, like they sort of say, it's a wonderful time today. Anyone we up can for work singing? And love and play okay. and be kind to each other. Waka Kosha Iwe, it, it means you're worthy. worthy. Wakakosha Iwe, it means you are important. Oh my goodness. I absolutely love that um, so much. And, and would you say that peer support is so important for, for I women? Th I think it's... I'm trying to find the word, but it's actually invaluable. Mm. It's incredibly invaluable. Um, and I'll say that because even, you know, you see some of us, we're here now talking publicly, mm. et cetera, but if it wasn't for peer support, I don't think I'd be here talking publicly. So it's, it's, the, it's everything. It starts with peer support. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was going to add that someone asked me this question once and I was thinking about it and I said, peer support is my manual mm. for living with HIV because that's just what it is. It, it's for me it's a lifeline that's what it's that's how I function <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, Susan if I can also say I mean for me peer support has gone beyond HIV uh, when I finally accepted my HIV status seven years into my diagnosis I thought for some reason I was the only person only woman only black woman only living with HIV 
until I was sent to um, to Angelina. And I think with that, not only with Angelina, with other sisters that I've that I've met, even other other uh, brothers that I've met, it's become more than just about HIV. If I need to bounce something off someone, it's become a circle of trust mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I know that this person is going to, and that peer support to me, although our doctors are not our peers, but I'm also very comfortable to go to one of our doctors that are within our HIV network to say, this is what I'm thinking. Mm. Mm. Because they, they value us as well, mm -hmm. that we're, we're more than just women living with HIV. We can be part of their research panel. We can, and that, to be part of the research, to be noticed by a doctor, it's because of peer support. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's such an important point. And all three of you are such powerful and Im in extraordinary advocates and leaders in, in the HIV field. And I spoke to Florence, so get ready for another uh, Florence video about the role of black women in leading the HIV response. So over to Florence now. Florence, what role do black women have in combating HIV stigma and leading the fight against HIV? I was at the AIDS 2022 conference earlier this year in Montreal, Canada. And the one thing that I definitely took away from that conference is that women, girls are leading the fight against HIV. Their voices, their lived experience has to be heard. They're already being empowered. They're already making a change. They're already working in their communities. I think funders, organizations, governments, politicians need to trust those women a lot more if we are really gonna combat and look at how we help and, and most importantly, make sure there, there are no more new transmissions of HIV. I think one of the really important things is how we make sure that the conversations that are happening at top level includes women's voices. So women are really, really central in terms of fighting that stigma that we know still exists within not just um, black and minority ethnic communities, but also in terms of the shame that sometimes are attached to women um, you know, women who find out that they are HIV positive. It's really, really vital that women's voices are central to this. And when I've seen those women in action, I know that the only way we can address this is having those women central to every single conversation. Funky, so you were one of these women in Montreal. Can you tell us about that? I, I was, and I, what I liked, I mean, I think uh, one thing that we cannot hide away about Montreal is the racism around the visa issue that a lot of our sisters from the global south, our sisters and brothers from the global south were denied visas to mm -hmm. come to, to this very important conference. So there were some voices that were not represented or not heard. But when uh, I met up with Florence, uh, she came to the, I took her to the Women Networking Zone where she heard the power of women leaders and what they're doing to A, you know, encourage people to test to, uh, to stay on treatment and to also talk about things that we're talking about, access to PrEP and things like that. But just for her to have a look at it in a different lens, to look at it as, you know, as, as a person in, in sort of in a government position. And, and I like that she didn't look only to old women like me, older women <laughs> like me. She was also very interested in understanding what young women living with HIV through Chiva, the Children uh, with HIV Association, were doing because they were represented at the conference. So it was a very holistic way of looking, looking at that. And there was a strong women leadership presence at this conference and almost um, a demand to be heard mm -hmm. and for space, which I loved, really. That sounds wonderful. If I'd like to just jump back to you, Red Grishy, about the importance of peer support and, and the patients that you see. Yeah, I think um, peer support is so invalu invaluable, as you said. Um, I do have some patients who have never um, shared their status with anybody, and they live their lives, but they have never told anybody. And it's always kind of, how can you get that first step to peer support from them? So I think as HIV services, we really need to think about how to get peer support workers into clinics. So it's literally mm -hmm. it's like, I'm taking you to the next room, and here's mm -hmm. someone that you can talk to, because that initial jump can be a big hurdle, I'm guessing, for mm -hmm. some people. But for me, you know, I work on the ward as well, so I see some very ill patients. 
um, many who have been out of care or not on treatment for a while. And one of the reasons is, is that they have experienced so much HIV stigma in their lives, it's made them not want to come into clinic or to contact healthcare services. So for me, you know, I think stigma kills. Mm -hmm. I think peer support is an absolutely essential part of support and care. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Angelina, as someone who's been really open about your HIV status for, for ages, were you, have you had any concerns about like potentially facing stigma in terms of being open? Gosh, um, well, I didn't actually just wake up and become open about it. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the, I mean, a, a, a number of things um, just made me decide that actually um, I'm going to be open about my status, even though there might be a potential for facing stigma. Um, first of all, I have to say peer support was essential in that, in that minute. But I have to say also that, you know, I have to remember my late mom was actually, um, is, do you say catalyst? Mm -hmm. mm. She was somebody who kind of set me on that path of being open. And I say that because when I told her about my status and it was over the phone, the how not to tell your mother you have HIV, <laughs> I told her over the phone and uh, I kind of felt relieved after telling her because I hadn't said anything. And then all she said to me was, I wish I was near you to give you a hug. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, you know, if my mother is okay about it, then actually I don't care what anybody else thinks. And so that was kind of the, the early days. But one of the things that also enabled me to be where I am is um, learning from mentors and peers. You know, I used to work at Positively Women many years ago. And people like, I have to mention Julie Reynolds, I kind of learned from her and many of the other women because I would go along with her when she was doing her talk. And I think, well, if she can do it, then that, you know, that would be okay. But one of the final things I'm going to share with you, there's lots that I could mm -hmm. tell you about how I got here, but I think I made a decision very early on um, that HIV was, was not going to define who I am. And also I kind of have this attitude whereby I think um, if you don't like me because I have HIV, then you can take a walk. I always I tell people, you know, I ask, you know, if somebody doesn't like you because you have HIV, ask them, do they, do they pay your rent? Mm. Do they feed you? Do they school your children? You know, if they don't, then actually you don't need them in your life. So I decided that's what I was going to do. If my family and my friends and my colleagues were okay about it, then I was going to be open about my status. But I just wanted to mention one thing in terms of... Um, being publicly open about my status. I don't believe that everybody has to be open about mm. their status. I think, I definitely believe that we need more visibility, but the more of us who can be open safely should do so. However, um, even just being open to one other person about your status can make a huge difference. Mm. And that's how I got here today as well. Mm. A lady, a friend of mine years ago, told me about her status. By then I hadn't told anybody. And like Fungi, I thought I was the only woman in London living with HIV. She told me about her status and I was able to open up about my status and she took me to a support group and I started volunteering, et cetera, et cetera. The rest is history. That same lady today is not open about her status, but her one action mm. of mm. telling me about her status is what got me here today. Mm. Wow. So it's really important that we recognize not everybody can be because others are, you know, emotionally, economically dependent on the significant others, so they can't be and that's okay. So those of us who can't should, and those who can't don't, but don't worry even if you tell one person. It makes a difference. <laughs> makes a difference. Mm. And, and how do you go about telling someone you have HIV? Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well. I actually asked one of my consultants, Daniel Richardson, before when I decided that I wanted to start dating again. And I said, okay, because I'm, I'm a researcher. I like the evidence, the facts and everything. I'm like... So if he takes me out to dinner, do I tell him at starter, main course, dessert? Do I wait for him to pay? Do, or, what is it? Then he just said, listen, why are you complicating? If they don't accept you with your HIV status, then they don't deserve you. Mm. But he sort of said you need to maybe, it depends on the type of relationship that, that you're in, really. What type of relationship is this? Mm. Is this a relationship that um, is everlasting and you cannot keep this big thing between you? forever and ever and ever, then yes, choose the right time. But I always say choose the time that is safe for you. Mm, if right. you feel safe and if you have all your information, you're already backed up, like um, Angelina was saying, I know my status, do you? Because we always assume that the person that we're telling in the relationship already knows their status. They're already not living with HIV. We make this assumption mm. when we actually don't know. I mean, I had somebody uh, text me on Messenger the other day saying, are you positive? Question mark. 
So I said, positive? Question mark. Then he said, are you undetectable? I'm like, of what? You know, because I need them. Like, I, I, I need them to, to just kind of like say the words. And I said, yes, I'm openly living with HIV. How about you? Mm. Yeah. I haven't heard back. Okay. Mm. Yeah. I think maybe to add to that just very quickly, also when in terms of how to tell somebody, I mm. think it's important not to make a big deal of it. Mm. Mm. You know, just do it. Maybe it's a partner or a friend, whatever you're cooking in the kitchen, you're chopping up the onions, you chop the onions, and by the way, I live with HIV mm. and I'm taking I medication, I can't pass it on. Mm. Pass the salt, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. I love it. <laughs> Just to add one last thing, I think um, I think it's important as well to ask yourself why you're telling someone about mm. your HIV because at the end of the day, it's your information and you have a right to it. And so if you ask yourself why, so that you tell people from a place of power mm. rather than from a place of weakness, like you choose, it's my information, I'm choosing yeah. to give it to you. Yeah. Mm. And so it's my right to choose. And so I choose whether I want to give you or not. Yeah, that has that's, to benefit you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but we just have to be conscious that, obviously, in the UK, we have certain rules, but p we, there may be people you know, living in other areas where there, there could be implications if you don't tell. Mm -hmm. but, Absolutely. But, and those are the things you need to take into consideration yeah. as well in terms yeah. of, you know, how, when, what information do you have, what do you need, what support do you need, how safe are you to do it, so many things. But, mm. you know, we're, I mean, we're doing it a bit tongue-in-cheek, but actually when you are able to say it, then there's different ways to do it rather than making it a big whole deal. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why U equals U is important as well because then at least you're on treatment and you're undetectable because mm. then that makes a difference as well. Yeah. And what I would like to say as well, um, Susan, and I just wanted to come to you, is uh, we have some doctors that I know will invite you and your potential partner or partner or child, whatever, and facilitate that conversation. Yes. Mm. Yeah, we've done that in, in clinic before. Mm. We have a choice. <laughs> you know, what is easier for you? You know, what would you like us to mm. support Absolutely. you with? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes the you cause you message can, can become quite confusing for somebody who doesn't yeah. understand it. Mm. And I, I've explained you call you to lots of people's partners before. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no. Uh, absolutely. And we've got lots of questions coming Ooh. through from the <laughs> audience. Um, as a mother, how would you recommend telling your child you have HIV? <laughs> Who would like? <laughs> Who was like looking at me right now? <laughs> 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 I'll give you my experience. Yes. Okay, so I told my daughter when she was nine years old, and some would say she was a bit young, but actually, as a parent, as a caregiver, you know what your child can take in or not. So at nine, I thought my daughter could understand, and also because by that point, I was quite open about my status. So I was able, I didn't want her to Google me and find out. Mm. And so um, I think the important things to think about is when you tell them about your status is about um, being able to explain it in a language that they will understand, mm. reassure them that you are okay, and reassure them that you keep on doing the things that you used to do, T tell them that you take treatment to keep you well, and let them ask you many questions. Um, and, if they, and if they can't ask you questions, have a backup person like Auntie Susan somewhere, who, Auntie Fungi, mm. who they can go to and talk to if they need to speak to someone, link them in to support. But I think you gauge and you decide, because some children at 16 may not be mature enough to take the information. Some children at 10 are quite mature enough to do it. So I chose to do it at that point because it, was, it worked for my situation. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And okay, let's get through some of these questions. One for you, Ragashri. What advice would you give to a young mum who has currently stopped ARVs due to weight gain and body changes? So I think if you can, please try to talk to your doctor about your worries because um, I would hope that your doctor would listen to you and take you seriously. And if they don't, then, as I said, you need to perhaps take someone with you who can advocate for you or ask to speak to somebody else. So we, you need a doctor, hopefully, who will hear you and then talk to you about your concerns and maybe talk about different antiretrovirals. Yes, we, have, we have lots of antiretrovirals these days, so we may be able to switch you to one that doesn't cause weight gain. And I think we're learning all the time about weight gain and antiretroviral drugs, so mm. I'm sure we'll find out more in the future as well. So please, if you can, try to talk to us, and if you can't, find a way in which you can, so ask to see somebody else. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Fungi, I'll, I'll direct this one to you. What advice would you give to a pregnant woman who has just found out that she's HIV positive? 
I'll send them to a gastric. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the advice uh, that I'd give them is have they tested during pregnancy or yeah, they, yeah, they've or, tested during pregnancy? We'll assume that they've tested during pregnancy. I think that is where a very specific peer support comes into, into play, like the mentor mothers, because they've been through that journey. Mm -hmm. It's just finding somebody that's walked, you, you can't walk literally into somebody's shoes, but somebody that's walked that similar journey. Tell them, as long as you stay on your medication, you, there are so many things that they can do now. You can give birth the way you want to do it. In the UK, if you choose to form a, to breastfeed, you can breastfeed and be supported to do that. And it's just about making sure that the mom, the, the young woman, the, the, the woman that's pregnant, lives a healthy pregnancy to be able to, able to deliver a healthy baby just like any other woman, regardless of their HIV status, um, mm. would, would do. So it's just about, you know, just being cautious, just also allowing that space to be open to extra clinic visits should they be required. Yeah, absolutely. Really good advice. And um, Angelina... I understand that you are co-authoring a book <laughs> about the, the experiences of African women with HIV. Would you like to tell us very briefly about this? Because we've got three minutes left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the book is, you know, it is to commemorate the 40 years of HIV, et cetera, et cetera, where really it's a collection of stories and experiences, mainly of Africa living with HIV, but also our allies, so some, some of the clinicians, but also some of the people who've worked within the HIV sector over the years, what we wanted to do was to celebrate the resilience and the strength and the leadership of African people, uh, what they've contributed to the res HIV response in the UK, because oftentimes what you hear and read about African people is almost the negative, the victim, etc. So we wanted to highlight the resilience, the contribution, and the strength mm -hmm. of African people, particularly women living with HIV in the UK. Fantastic, thank you. It's due out in spring 2020. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. Um, another question that's come through, if we have a quick answer from you, Regashri. Do you think injectable HIV treatment can help someone who is worried that other people might see that they've got medication? I definitely think it's an option. Yeah. I think the more options we have, the more choice people have, so yes. So if someone in the UK is interested in injectable treatment, what advice would you give? Please speak to your HIV doctor. They can see whether you're eligible for it and whether we can offer it to you. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh my goodness, we have only got two more minutes to go. So I think I'll do a quick fire question to everyone. What advice would you give? give to someone who is um, feeling self-stigma about HIV? And we'll just go around tackling it. Are you looking at me again? We're going to start. <laughs> We're going to go around. We're going to ask you okay. all. Right. You are not alone. Mm. HIV is a tiny virus. It's not a moral issue. With access to treatment, to care and support, you can lead a healthy, fulfilling life. Have a family if you want. Have a relationship if you want. It's not the end of the world. You can live your best life. Fantastic. I would say find peer support wherever you can find it. And if you're a woman living with HIV, come to our Self Stigma a workshop on the 23rd of November. Fantastic. <laughs> I would say it is, it is also okay to ask for other therapies, like talking therapies. Mm -hmm. And if you feel that you need to go on some medication, it is okay. Use as many tools as you can to get through whatever you're going through. Wonderful. I guess you. So I would say all of those things that you just <laughs> said, but also it's not, don't feel ashamed. Mm. You know, it's okay. Lots of people are in, a, are in your position or lots of people need to ask help for something and it's not shameful to ask for help. Mm. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much. I've absolutely loved the session. I'd like to say a huge thank you to the awesome disruptive team who've been doing all kinds of stuff with videos today. I'd like to thank Florence Shalomi, who's not here in person, but is here in spirit. I would like to thank Fast Track Cities for their support for the anti-stigma work and for everyone who has watched today and next week on Monday at six o'clock there will be an AIDS map live broadcast where we will be discussing if we can indeed get to zero 
HIV infections by 2030. So join me then. Thanks very much. Bye.